Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. And today Jack is joining me for the Shining Legends set review. It's a set that's recently just dropped and will be becoming legal in a couple of weeks time. And it's also quite an interesting set, it's sort of like a stopgap set, quite a small one that's also received a bit of stick for not being the most competitive. But we have found some diamonds in the rough and we're going to be talking about all of the most interesting and impactful cards from this set as well as every GX as well. Uh, no matter how good they are just because these will be the cards you'll be pulling and you'll find out which ones are troll and which ones are actually good. So there you go. Yeah, as always we have stuck with our five star sort of rating system. We've had this for the past couple of set reviews. Uh, as Joe said, the set is quite small so um, the stats at the end are kind of skewed because the set is really quite small. But feel free to pause here if you want to see an in-depth analysis of how we are rating these cards. Uh, just a quick note though, sort of one-star cards are going to be cards that we are, we consider interesting but unlikely to ever see play. And five-star cards are cards that are likely to potentially bring back an archetype in the format or make their own archetype or be seen in a lot of different decks. So that's kind of um, the highs and lows of the star system. Feel free to pause for the rest of it. Finally, the ratings are given based on the current format we're in right now. The only slight difference, as Joe said, is because this is a stopgap set, we actually have another set coming out in about a month's time, Crimson Invasion, and there are a couple of uh, cards that we've uh, sort of added in here and there as well um, at when we're talking about these, because the first big tournaments that we see with these cards, over here in Europe at least, will contain both Crimson Invasion and Shining Legends. So that's it's slightly different because this set it has been released at a kind of an awkward time. Um, but other than that, it's as as normal with our rating system, um, and just keep an eye on sort of where 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 the, these cards are going to fit in our current format, rather than uh, particularly far in the future. So let's jump into it. Starting with Venusaur, he is the stage two um, that we know him so well for, and uh, now that Forest of Giant Plants is gone, it's actually like a more traditional stage two where you'll probably have to rare candy into this guy. He's got 160 HP, which is pretty good for a stage 2, uh, especially because he'll be chilling on the bench, so hopefully he can uh, remain healthy and won't be an easy uh, Lysander target, or I guess Guzma now. And uh, we have the ability Jungle Totem, which is the main talking point for the card. Each basic grass energy attached to your Pokemon provides two grass energy, and uh, this is not stackable, so no matter how many Venusaur you have in play, each of your grass will only... Um, provide two grass and that's a little bit annoying. This card is a throwback to Gardevoir back from Next Destinies. That was a card that never really saw much play despite some people trying to um, fiddle around and make it work. It just never was perfect and it feels the same way for Venusaur in my eyes. There's a handful of like mediocre options for you. You can do the Durant for some mill which is quite cool um, but there's not many good ways to put damage on Durant which is annoying. Mega Beedrill, um, everyone's been looking to try and make a Paralysis Lock style deck work, but in a format with Guzma and Acerola, it doesn't feel very likely, even though you can chain the attack much more consistently than you ever could, um, and Max Potion becomes much more viable, but that already sounds super clunky because it's a Mega line and a Stage 2 line and all that other stuff. Um, Bulu has always been played with Vikavolt recently as a nice accelerator. You now have the extra option of Venusaur, I personally think Vikavolt's probably just better because it works from the deck, thins your deck, which is also really good. And you have, because you're using two different types of energy, you have different attackers you can play in the deck, which isn't really the case for Venusaur Bulu. And then there are two more grass basic Pokemon, which we'll get into in a minute, the Genesect and the Verizian. Both are quite interesting, but overall I think their power level is just under the bar. So I'm expecting Venusaur to be not highly played right now, but it's one that you sort of have to keep an eye on when you start analysing future grass types. Yeah, for sure. Venusaur, comparing it to some of the other Stage 2s right now, I think is one of the best ways of seeing whether Venusaur is going to place in the meta. And right now, some of the only Stage 2 decks that we have have a good ability like Jungle Totem um, in some capacity, but they also have a good attack themselves. And I think that's where Venusaur is kind of falling down, because it doesn't really matter that it's, a, that it's a Stage 2 anymore. We've seen that Stage 2 decks can work. The unfortunate thing is you then have to supplement it with something else. So I think that's why Venusaur is probably going to stay in the binder for now. But as you've said, always worth thinking about when we see these grass attackers now, knowing that we could have some really quick acceleration for them. And if we can find the right attacker for this deck, then there definitely could be something there. 
Next up, we have Verizion, which is one of the cards that we mentioned on the previous slide. As you can see, a 110 HP basic. First attack wraps in wind, search, uh, does 30, and you can attach an energy from your hand to this Pokemon. Uh, it's kind of irrelevant because you're going to be playing with um, Venusaur a lot of the time anyway. But that being said, that can mean you've attached two energy, ready to use Pike, and you can start attaching energy elsewhere next turn. Pike is why we've got this Darker on here as well. Uh, it's essentially Night Spear on a non-EX. Obviously, this is for two damage, uh, for two energy when you have Venusaur out, so that's really, really nice. Um, and Pike, or the damage from Pike, or a Night Spear side attack, can actually be quite relevant at the moment, uh, considering with, there's um, some sort of use for Devolve in our current format. Pike can actually set up um, multiple sort of devolution attacks in one uh, in, in across two turns if you hit for example a guardy and a guardy on the bench and then if you target a different guardy and do the 30 damage on the bench again next turn um, you're actually able to devolve three guardies at once which you know that that can be a huge game swing unfortunately we have only rated this one star simply because it does look like uh, venusaur won't be a good enough archetype to see play i think if the Venusaur deck ever does get going, this will be a fantastic, at least one of attacker if we don't have much better um, in the format at the time. But for now, because Venusaur isn't going to see play uh, and we have a, a grass deck in Vikabulu, uh, there's no real space for Verizion in the format right now. Yeah, that's exactly it. If Venusaur was to work, Verizion would probably be put in there, at least as like a one of for early game uh, acceleration. Uh, but it just doesn't look to be a powerful enough deck right now. That brings us on to Shining Genesect, another card that people pair with Venusaur. Um, it has a pretty cool ability, similar to Flareon EX's Flash Fire, and it's called Energy Reload. Once during a turn, you may move a Grass Energy from one of your other Pokemon to this Pokemon. That's pretty cool. Um, so, again, like we said with the Verizion, it, atta it attaches to itself. Now you can Energy Reload it onto your Genesect for um, other attacks as well, which is nice. Its Gaia Blaster attack is similar to the Raikou. Um, it does 50 plus 20 more times the amount of grass energy attached to this Pokemon. So with a Venusaur in play and two energy, you're still sort of looking at a two shot range. Pretty efficient, I guess. But the fact that you're using Venusaur to double up on energy is much worse than energy acceleration because you still need to physically have two grass on the board. So although your damage is increased by having the two grass that become four grass, it's still physically two energies that you need to have on yourself which is really annoying when you don't actually play Acceleration. So it's still kind of slow for me. Um, its ability is cute, but right now it just seems, again, just below the bar of playability. Um, there's potential, maybe, because it can also take Rainbow Energies, um, because once Rainbow Energy is in play on your board, you can actually, you know, it counts as a Grass Energy, so you can move them onto your Genesect. So I think if ever this sees play, it could be just because it could be a card to help improve your Greninja matchup if you're a deck that's already playing Rainbow Energies and Double Colorless Energies you can Energy Reload onto your Genesect power him up in one turn by attaching a DCE for the turn and start using Gaia Blaster to deal with um, regular Greninjas it obviously doesn't get rid of the breaks but it can be nice so maybe this card sees play as like a one of in some Rainbow Energy decks to try and improve Greninja maybe even like a Counter Energy could work um, who knows so yeah, he's flexible just because of his ability, but for now he doesn't seem powerful enough to be a mainstay in an archetype. Yeah, the ability is really, really cool. And we have seen in the past these attacks like Gaia Blaster, Blaze Ball, and Thunder Lance. They have warranted some play um, somewhat, but I think, again, there's just not too much support for Grass right now. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that Volk is definitely making an impact on the meta right now. So on top of all of this that we've talked about with the grass types, they have a pretty inherently bad matchup in general against Volk, which is pretty rough. So just in general, again, it looks like Shining Genesect probably won't see too much play straight out the gate. But I think this is probably the card out of the three that we've talked about so far that is the most likely to slip, slip in as a one of in some decks, just because, like you say, the ability can be really, really strong. Next up, we have Shining Celebi. Something to note about this card just before we get into it. Uh, it's actually a promo card. It's not in the official set. So it's, uh, that's why we've got a Japanese scan right now, but we have indeed included the um, text on the card for you guys so we, you know exactly what um, it does. As you can see, it's got the exact same ability as Celebi EX. Each of your evolved Pokemon can use any attacks from its previous evolutions, uh, which is a fantastic ability to have um, in the right decks. And that inherently is what is 
uh, going to define how good this card is. If there is a deck that has a strong stage one or two, that has um, sort of a basic that it can abuse and with an attack, you know, it's gonna it, we're gonna see play for Shining Celebi. It's without a doubt an upgrade for the old Celebi um, EX because it's only giving up one prize, and obviously in expanded. There aren't too many decks that use Celebi, but they now have a better option. Uh, the only three things that we could find straight off the um, straight off the bat were Magikarp and two Pikachu's that we've seen so far. Magikarp using Flail on the new GX, uh, which unfortunately we're not talking about today, but we will talk about in not too long time. Um, the GX Gyarados GX has 240 HP, so Flail can actually hit some pretty big numbers um, for only one energy. One of the things with Gyarados is it does require a lot of energy to attack. So actually, Shining Celebi could sneak some play into there if it turns out Gyarados is good, because you could be doing um, a decent chunk of damage for one energy, which is pretty nice. And then the Pikachus, we're going to be talking about Raichu GX a little bit later on. Um, and both of these Pikachus could potentially be cards that you uh, could play now. We have uh, Thunder Wave on one of them and Charge on another. Thunder Wave, obviously, flip me coin if heads your opponent is paralysed. As we've said, um, not as useful whilst we don't have or in a format full of Guzma and stuff. But if you're able to do that without sort of hurting your own setup, there's things that it's already different to the Beedrill. The whole Beedrill deck is designed around paralyzing. But Thunder Wave is just getting paralysis every now and again whilst you're setting up. And sometimes that is, that's the difference between a deck built around paralysis and just a deck that has the option to use paralysis. So yeah, we could see play there. And Charge is the other one we could use. Searching a deck for a Lightning Energy and attaching it to the Raichu being able to self-accelerate, which is really, really nice in the early turns of the game. So yeah, Celebi will be defined by the evolutions in the meta. We've given it three stars because uh, if if there is a, ever a deck that can abuse it, it will without a doubt see play. But currently, um, we don't know for sure how good Raichu is going to be. And that's the only one sort of out of the gate that we've spotted so far that could really abuse Shining Celebi. Yeah, I really love this ability. Um, we've seen it in Shrine of Memories, uh, a stadium card. We've seen it with the EX, that never really took off just because it was such easy prizes. But now there's like no downside. If you have a deck that has pre-evolutions with good attacks, there's very little downside for you just shoving in one Shining Celebi and getting value out of it. Right now there's not a huge amount of cards, uh, as we've just said, but I think because there's like such a low amount of drawback to having this in your deck, we'll see a lot more of this than we ever did for uh, Celebi EX and also Shrine of Memories, there was a couple of problems with that because oftentimes decks need their own specific stadium anyway, so you had to choose which one you wanted, and also um, that can be bounced as well by your opponent's field blowers and other stadium cards. So this is a much more permanent state of affairs. Obviously abilities get shot off as well, but um, with your own field blowers you can get them back. So um, I want to experiment with the Gyarados because that much HP is just something that you can't really sleep on. And um, it's almost got like the Ninetales GX effect where people will do like weird amounts of damage just to play around Flail. So they'll just be sort of poking you for a bit. And when people aren't doing much, that gives you time to build up other Gyarados on your bench with Aqua Patches and such. So just one Gyarados in the active with one water energy just sat there chilling can be like a real threat for people if you play the Celebi. So really cool card. I think right now it only has mediocre potential, but it has bags full for later on. So Definitely one that I would pick up a one copy of, exactly. Next up we have Entei GX. So many decks right now are based around Fire-type attackers. There's the Ho-Oh Salazzle, and there's also Volcanion in both Standard and Expanded, tearing it up. So we have another Fire-type to the arsenal of basic attackers. This one only has 180 HP, which is a little bit annoying. We've seen so often that the 190 from both Turtonator and Ho-Oh changes the numbers, changes what you get knocked out to. Most importantly, things like Drampa and uh, even things like Espeon GX as well. So that 180, not quite as good as its other contestants and its attacks also sort of fall short a little bit as well. Combustion for a Fire Colors does 50, uh, with no effect of the attack. Then Fire Fang for two Fire and a Colors does 100 and Burn, so it's effectively 120 with the new Burn rules. Uh, again, still just a little bit shy of the mark, less damage than a Bright Flame, and obviously less damage than the Phoenix Burn as well, but it's one energy less. And its GX attack is an interesting one. Um, for the same cost of two Fire and a Colorless, you deal 150 to one of your opponent's bench. 
Dealing damage to the bench is pretty decent, but when you're a Volcanian deck, you're more than likely trying to blow up the active. And 150, again, just shy of a good number in like 170 or 180. That would obviously be an absurd GX attack. Um, but when Volcanian doesn't typically run any sniping of its own, you would have to set it up with like early shell traps, early sacred fires. Um, it just doesn't really make much sense. It feels like it's way worse than its other two counterparts in ho -Oh and Turtonator. Two very good cards, we have to admit. Um, so maybe if these cards weren't printed, Entei would be thrown in, but it just is outclassed basically right now. Yeah, it's a bit unfortunate for Entei. Um, it has been outclassed here. I know there's a lot of fans of Entei as well. There's a lot of people that I think if this card had been good, it would have seen a lot of backing anyway. But unfortunately, as you say, the only uh, app, uh, like practical use I can see for this is the 150 snipe on the bench in a Volk deck. But as you've said, because there's no real way to set this up efficiently, you don't want to be sacred firing in a Volk deck. You just don't want to do it. So because this is just off the mark of knocking out a Lele, I don't think this will see play. I think if this, like you say, if this was 170, this could actually see play in a Volk deck because it can just clean up the game. Um, but unfortunately, it's its other two counterparts mean that it's just not quite good enough. Next up, we have Croconaw, which is one of the more interesting Pokemon we're talking about today. Uh, has the plunge ability once during your turn. If this Pokemon is on your bench, you can move all energy from your active Pokemon to this Pokemon. And if you do, you switch it with the active. Um, so yeah, this is a really, really interesting ability. Very similar to Aero Trail. A little bit less um, sort of flexible with the energy, but a little bit more flexible because you don't have to do it the turn you play it. So that's really interesting. Uh, the biggest downside is currently we have no good for alligators in the format, uh, meaning that you're moving into a Croconaw, evolving into a for alligator, and then doing a really pretty underwhelming attack. Hyper Whirlpool does 60, and you flip a coin until you get tails. Uh, for each hedge, you discard an energy. That's really cool if you can hit multiple heads, but you know sometimes you're going to be doing three for 60. Uh, which is kind of weak and then second strike does 80 and if they've got any damage on them yeah you do 80 more so 160 for four again it's kind of weak especially as you're only 150 hp yourself there will be things that knock you out uh guardy does guardy knocks this out for one energy if you're going to try for second strikes that kind of thing so it's just an overcosted card uh but whilst we have plunge in the format if there ever is a good for alligator uh, this is definitely going to be the Croconaw you play. So maybe look up your four alligator cards a little bit more in depth as as and when they're released. But for now, this is a pretty interesting but underwhelming ability. Yeah, the ability's cool. It's just nothing around him is useful. So one to keep an eye on, I guess. Next up, we have Manaphy. It's a basic 60 HP water type with the ability Blessings of the Deep. Once during a turn, you may heal 20 damage from one of your Pokemon that has any water energy attached to it. Um, we have recently lost rough seas in water decks. It was oftentimes a theme of water decks to have this sort of healing between turns aspect, removing damage. Manaphy is now an option for these decks. Um, it could also be used in some sort of rainbow deck, or we've seen blend energy be very good in expanded, actually the other type of blend energy. But these are things that we have to keep in mind now that we have the expanded format on our radar. Um, just for some healing in between turns. Um, it is Brooklyn Hill searchable. It's a pretty nice way of doing little bits of healing. And if you have multiple mana fees, it's obviously stackable. So in theory, you could heal 80 every single turn with all your mana fees on any of your dudes that has water energy attached. That's a lot of healing, but it's also a lot of work and it's a lot of bench space. And you, com you can't commit that amount of any of those things really um, into the decks that we have in the format, Ninetales, used to play rough seeds because it was just so easy and you could contest the stadium war uh manaphy is just way worse and it's an ability um so there's not much room for it really um it would be cool to do 80 healing in between turns in like a skyfield build and expanded but expanded is a place where everything gets one hit kills anyway so pretty useless card overall yeah it's only comparable to rough seas really and right now there's no real use for rough seas even if it wasn't the format i don't think it would change too much it would go in water decks already, but the water decks that we have are kind of um, not looking for Manaphy in particular right now. So yeah, pretty underwhelming. Next up we have Keldeo, which we've gone for two stars on this. This feels like one of the cards that a lot of people may have glossed over on the first look at the set. Uh, we're looking at Resolute Blade um, as the attack. Does For two water, does 20, plus 20 more for each of your benched Pokemon. 
Uh, that's the exact same text as Mind Jack from Absol, uh, which did see play back in the day when Plasma was good. Uh, this is a really nice non EX attacker in the Plasma decks. Um, and because we have Aqua Patch now, you can actually set this up in a turn, which is really, really nice. Um, so in Water decks, could this be uh, a nice non, non EX attacker? Uh, I think Aqua Box is what seeks a non EX the most. It's Lost, uh, Regice, and Articuno. So I could definitely see this as a one of a uh, nice non EX attacker in. Um, Aquabox to try and skew the prize trade. Uh, the biggest application with, uh, in, in theory-wise, in our minds, though, is uh, this Counter Energy Dot deck, which Counter Energy is a, is a card in Crimson Invasion. As I've said, we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth in a couple of weeks' time. But just so you know now, uh, this is a special energy card that can be attached to uh, non-EXs or non-GXs uh, that provides two of any type of, uh, any type of energy, provided you're behind on prizes. Uh, so th the kind of style of deck you're going to go for is a deck that goes down a couple of prizes to set up uh, whichever attackers it needs and then is able to efficiently win the prize trade back by using counter energy for a couple of turns um, and then finishing the game out with regular energy and DCE, that kind of thing. Uh, and this could be the answer to Volk. Obviously, with one counter energy, you only need four Pokemon on the bench to knock out a Volk, five if they have a Fury Belt. But this is the kind of deck where you're going to have a lot of Pokemon on the bench anyway because you're going to be wanting to uh, be able to stream attackers because it's going to be a lot of non-EXs. Plus, you're also going to want to have options in case your opponent tries to play around the attackers you're playing or, uh, that you're playing. So, you know, it's it's like it fits into the deck really well. Um, it's just whether this counter energy dot deck is going to, going to be competitive. And it does receive some pretty interesting cards. Plus, there are some pretty nice cards already in the format that we can look at. Um, we're not going to go into it too much into it now, but... This could definitely be the answer to Volk for this deck if it, it does turn out to be an archetype uh, that we see in the future. Yeah, this is basically a teaser for how much we both love counter energy <laughs> <laughs> because we're looking at all sorts of options and thinking, well, maybe this attacker that looks terrible on paper could work and that's just the power of counter energy potentially. So yeah, Jack, you're spot on. It's cool in the counter energy deck and probably does fill the niche of the non-EX role in uh, Aquabox. It's not the best attacker on its own, but just because there are literally no other options right now, it probably sneaks in. And Aquabox really hasn't been doing well recently, so I wonder if having a 7th prize style Pokemon CAD uh, could swing it back into favour. Uh, I'm not sure, but um, it's definitely a step in the right direction. Moving on to Shining Volcanion. This has also been a card that has, for some reason, was like the poster boy of the set for abuse, really. A lot of people looked at him and just thought he's really, really bad, which is kind of unwarranted, I feel like. I think it does actually have some potential. And it's a card that I'm actually going to play around with early on in the set. It's a 130 HP basic, which is very nice. Its first attack is Dual Pump, and this is the one that we want to pay most attention to. For 3 Water Energy, you deal 50 damage to 2 of your opponent's Pokémon. That is the same as the Dual Splash attack from Kyogre EX. Kyogre saw some play in Archie Stoice. Um, to try and do spread damage against uh, things like combies and also things uh, like night marchers and this is something that we can now do in a non-EX form so it becomes a much better one of in Archie Stoice which is very nice for you. Um, additionally I think because we have Aqua Patch in standard just like how we were saying with Keldeo um, Shining Volcanion could also bring a new era to Aquabox because Aqua Patch is just such an insane card. If you have four Aqua Patch, four Elixir, you can set up Dual Pump very consistently. Um, you know, like two times over basically, which is really cool. And then just have other backup attackers. And 50 damage to two specific targets is really good when we're in a format where Devolve is rife and pretty much everywhere. Um, so maybe almost having like the Shell of a Ninetales list now just becomes an all basic list where you have Shining Volcanion. Keldeo, then you have some Cocos and Espeon, you can do some really cool trickery with your dual pump action and that's going to be pretty nice for you. So I think it's a pretty cool card. What I also like is you're great against non-EXs as well because the main non-EX deck is a fire deck. So you're already playing all the water stuff. So in theory you beat the best non-EX deck and in theory you have great devolve packages. So it looks like it could be a fun counter deck to explore. Its second attack is terrible. Quad Smash does 50, uh, flipping four coins, 50 for each heads. I mean, it could be a Hail Mary at some points with a choice band, I guess. But yeah, um, 
mainly just in here for dual pump. I think it's a card that's been slept on and has sort of become a meme of the set, but really doesn't deserve it because I think this card has more than zero potential. Yeah, we've gone for two stars. Hopefully it will see some play. Um, and hopefully we'll have some fun with it on our streams for the next couple of weeks as well. It's definitely going to be one that I think both of us test around a little bit. So next up we have another GX, Raichu GX. Now this one has seen quite a lot of uh, hype behind it. We've only gone for three stars though because we're not sold on exactly how um, influential this is going to be on the format. But onto the card itself, 210 HP stage one. Pretty standard for where we're kind of looking at GX wise at the moment. First attack, powerful spark, does for a DCE does 20 plus 20 more times the amount of lightning energy on your Pokemon, which is the exact same text as Dark Pulse. Uh, so a lot of people wrote this card off immediately because it was a stage one Dark Pulse, uh, or stage one Dark Rai, and Dark Rai isn't seeing any play. But actually the card is very different. Um, this powerful spark is definitely a very, very good approach for the, uh, for the deck, but you do actually have access to Thunder, which is his second attack for three energy, does 160 damage and you take 30 yourself, meaning that even if this powerful spark sort of approach hasn't gone well, you can still take knockouts uh, just doing a huge chunk of damage, which is kind of where Darkrai lacks. It really, really relies on having a very big board setup. Uh, and if it doesn't have that board setup, then its damage cap is very low. Whereas this Raichu just has to attach a third energy and all of a sudden it's hitting at least 160 again. So that's why whilst these, whilst these cards literally have the exact same text, um, they're actually very, very different in playstyle. Finally, the GX attack for 3 energy. Voltail D GX does 120 damage and paralyzes the opponent. I think this is pretty underwhelming, um, considering we have Guzma and Acerola in the format right now. But, you know, it's nice having a GX attack that is, uh, I guess, annoying if you maybe end your opponent down to a 1 or 2 card hand. Um, you could guarantee yourself the win next turn. So there, there are, will be applications for this um, GX attack, but there are often going to be better options. Uh, regarding support, this is really where um, Raichu shines, and this could be why Raichu could see itself making a break into the format. Uh, we've got currently got two non-EX non Raichus that actually both could easily fit into the deck. We've got the new one from Burning Shadows, which has the Evo Shock ability, which paralyzes your opponent, uh, when it evolves from your hand. And again, whilst its uh, paralysis isn't any anywhere near as good as it used to be, uh, it still can be annoying. It's not like, as I said earlier on, with the Pikachu and the Beedrill. Um, it's more like the Pikachu style, where you just do it as a supplement, you're not building your deck around paralysis, but if you're able to get a turn where your opponent can't get out of this paralysis, you've essentially got yourself a free turn. So that's a nice option to have. We also have the non-GX Raichu from uh, Generations, with Circle Circuit, which is just a decent non-EX attacker. Whilst it doesn't have Skyfield anymore, it is capped at 100. Uh, that can still take a decent chunk off of a GX. And because you're going to be trading uh, one, uh, two for one with GXs, um, you can finish things off uh, for, for only one prize and push yourself up in the prize trade, which is nice. Regarding some other cards, uh, Tapu Koko is a likely include in the deck simply because Tapu Thunder is one of these big one-shot uh, GX attacks, and as I mentioned with Voltail, it's not it's not fantastic, it's not awful, but there are going to be games where it's just going to be, you're just able to use Tapu Thunder, drop a Tapu Koko onto the board uh, that you've already got three energy on, and just take two prizes out of nowhere, which is another really nice thing for a deck to have. It's nice knowing that you only have to take four prizes through regular attacks, because you know you'll have this big uh, sort of swing turn with a GX attack at some point during the game. We've also got Zerkatry GX, which is another of the cards that is going to be released around Crimson Invasion time, um, which is, again, another really, really nice GX to have. It's got a really, really nice ability. Uh, its GX attack is pretty annoying in the early game. Um, so, you know, it, it is gonna, it's going to—it's another card that you may be able to fit into the deck. And finally, regarding uh, Energy Acceleration, to if you're going down this powerful Spark route, we've got a new Raikou, which we're going to talk about in a moment, uh, that is essentially uh, Oblivion Wing Yveltal. Um, so that's a really, really nice early game attacker for this while you're evolving into your Raichus on the bench, while you're maybe Evo shocking and stuff, just doing a little bit, just doing a few pokes. And we've also got Electrode if you want to go down that route, giving up a prize, but really pushing Powerful Spark into one-shot range a lot quicker. So you're giving up one prize, but maybe you're taking the first two prizes of the game. So you have to weigh up whether you want to be running this Electrode to try and uh, increase the amount of damage you're doing in the early game uh, in, in return for losing a prize. 
yeah, I'm a big fan of Raichu. Uh, it just has so much support, so many directions that you can take it. It feels like it will be one of these cards that you basically have to test for like three weeks to figure out the best 60, the best support. I think um, the Tapu Koko, as you said, probably definitely goes in as a one-off. The Raikou seems much better than Electrode. Um, having things like Evo Shock Raichu, even as like a one or two of, um, just to buy yourself turns to build up your board, is going to be really good for you. What I really like is that it's it's Turbo Darkrai, but it actually has a plan B. Thunder, as you said, with a choice band is 190, that's good. Uh, you have the big Tapu Thunder GX attack to take one big knockout as well. So um, Raichu is pretty nice, um, even though it is a stage one um, that does the same thing as a Darkrai and has the same weakness. And both Pokemon basically hit zero uh, weakness themselves because Lightning and Dark are two types that really um, doesn't hit anything important right now. Um, but just because there's so much support for Raichu, it could stand up to uh, decks in the format because it can finish games off even if your energy starts depleting. You just need, you know, like one Raichu in play to still get one hit KOs. So pretty cool card overall. Next up, let's talk about the Raikou more detailed now. It's a 120 HP basic, which is pretty strong. And it has the attack Booming Thunder. It does 30 and you get to attach a lightning energy from your discard pile to one of your bench just for one lightning of its own. Um, it's Baby Veltal basically, but for a um, lightning energy and its secondary attack is Electric Ball for three, or well, two lightning and the color lets you do 90 as well. Um, just a really reasonable card. We've seen these sorts of Veltal style attackers fit into decks and right now it feels like a reasonable include in both Raichu and Tapu Koko GX. Me and Jack are actually talking about Raikou and thinking whether it's actually time to revive Tapu Koko. Now with a good early game attacker that can also get more energy on the board, Raikou can do a lot for Tapu Koko. Doing those early 30s or 60s with a choice band leads into Sky High Claws very nicely for finishing off Pokemon. Um, then you have your GX attack, which is still you know a really powerful one at any point in the game. Um, and what's great is you still have Elixir's support, you have early game pressure, and you're much less likely to fizzle. That's the big problem of Tapu Koko decks at the moment. The whole aspect is Aero Trail, tank hits, move between your Kokos and use Ace Arola. But if people do one hit KO Koko, you've lost the game. Um, now with the Raikou, you probably have a little bit more acceleration to maybe keep you in the game that much longer uh, to keep having threats turn after turn. So maybe with a couple turns of development on the Raikou side, you can chain Tapu Koko all game. And that's a really appealing factor, so I think Coco is something that is worth revisiting now that we have Raikou in the format. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be one I try out. I tried out Coco again a couple of weeks ago on stream. Um, so maybe Raikou is just what it needs to uh, push it into the boundary of playable. Um, so yeah, Raikou is definitely... I mean, Oblivion Wing has been in the format for like three or four years now, and it's always seen play it's pretty much always seen play in a semi-competitive deck this is one of the only times right now that i think it's not being played particularly because dark isn't a great type right now um but other than that pretty much ever since it was released it's always seen play uh so raikou there's no reason to believe raikou won't see the sim a similar amount of play provided electric is a relevant type in the format next up we have mewtwo gx uh another gx of the set i seem to have Hit another one here. Um, unfortunately, this one isn't quite as impressive as Raikou, but we have gone for two stars simply because a lot of people wrote this off as just fin finally a bad Mewtwo card. Uh, but actually, you know, his GX attack is G-Booster, and G-Booster was a pretty good attack. Um, so, you know, it's it's there's definitely potentially something here. Uh, the rest of the card is pretty irrelevant. 190 HP is really, really nice, as we've mentioned already. It's much better than 180. Full Burst for one Psychic does 30 times the amount of energy attached to Mewtwo, uh, which is essentially a worse Guardi, because for every energy you stack on, Guardi is doing 30 more. Uh, so you're never going to be trading efficiently with a Guardi, unfortunately, uh, and you have um, resistance on a couple of other things. Plus you're not taking into account uh, their energy as well, so it's a pretty irrelevant attack. Super Absorption for two energy does 60 and heals 30, which again, two for 60 is a really, really weak number, unfortunately. Uh, but as I said, Psy Strike GX for three um, Psychic Energy does indeed do 200 damage and goes through all effects on your opponent's active Pokemon. Uh, so no safeguard, no this Pokemon can't be affected by basics next turn, none of this stuff. You're doing 200 damage, deal with it. So 
this is why we've given this card the extra star. I, I think a lot of people would put this a, a one-star card regularly. Uh, but actually, with things like Max Elixir and the new Shining Mew, which we're going to talk about momentarily, um, you can set up Psy Strike pretty quickly and just take two prizes. Uh, and as I've mentioned, taking two prizes is really good if it means if they're your last two prizes. If you're able to just build up a Mewtwo on the bench with a Choice Band and just have that sitting there for the rest of the game, you can't be end out of game because you have 230 damage on your board. You know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so that's why this could potentially be a one-of in some decks. I'm not completely sold because I think there are other GX attackers that definitely compete with it and definitely could be argued are more efficient. Uh, but I don't think it's. I think it's one that will definitely be tested and could be a nice bench sitter um, for these Garbodor style decks that are already running Psychic Energy. Yeah, there's a lot of decks already running Psychic Energy. I think the fact that its own weakness is Psychic is probably the thing holding it back most. Um, but as you said, with Elixirs, even if you play the Shining Mew potentially. Um, in other Garbodor variants, maybe this is a GX attack that Drampagarb can use. Um, I was always a fan of playing Elixirs in Drampagarb. It never really kicked off, but maybe with a Mewtwo GX attack now, you get one big knockout with a Choice Band. You're knocking out even things like Guardi, which is excellent. Um, so you take one big knockout, and then Dramp takes a knockout, and then Garbodor takes a knockout, and you've won the game. Um, it's not as bad as it looks. Um, plenty of decks do need their own GX attack specifically, but... For decks that don't really need a GX, um, yeah, Side Strike's pretty good. And Full Burst as well is actually pretty good early game pressure um, with like Choice Band on top and stuff. So um, it's early pressure. It can KO like Trubbishes quickly as well to maybe deny your opponent getting Garbodors going. So I think it's actually a reasonable card. Um, not great, obviously, but it's reasonable. And maybe we'll see Side Strike here or there as just like a big blow up style attack because that could be pretty cool. Next up, we've just mentioned Shining Mew. This is what it does. It's a 30 HP Pokemon. That is right. Just 30 HP. We are in 2017, folks, but somehow this has still been printed. It does have free retreat, which is very, very good. Um, and it has two attacks, both for a psychic cost. The first one uh, is the one we want to look at. Legendary Guidance. Search your deck for up to two energy cards and attach them to your Pokemon in any way that you like. Um, so it says energy cards. That means it can be both basic and special, you can take your pick, whatever you want, and pull them straight from the deck. Accelerating from the deck is one of the best ways that you can get energy onto the board because um, it thins your deck, which is really nice, and you know you don't need to have a hand or anything just to pull this off. Um, and you can get some of the most powerful cards straight onto your board. Double colorless energy in a bunch of decks. Um, could even be in Drampa Garbador because you're already playing Psychic Energies. Um, and as well as the counter energy deck that me and Jack were talking about, maybe this is your front man to get some energy on the board in general and set up your counter energy style approach because you only have 30 HP. You'll be going down very, very quickly. Um, so I kind of like Shining Mew. It's got free retreat, which is cool. I think you need to build quite specifically around it to make it work. But who knows, there could be some like rogue archetype around and... Um, I also like in Dramp Garb, actually. It seems like a good one-off to me because the trade-off of sending in one attachment and one prize nets you uh, two DCs on, like, two different Drampers. I think I would almost always take that trade. I think that's, like, a really, really good thing um, because it just sets you up for the rest of the game, pretty much. Two Drampers, and then you can just mindly attach the rest of the game. It sounds really good to me. So, um, yeah, Shining Mew has potential as well but again just under the bar because of its liability of hp more than anything else yeah whilst we don't have the sigil in the format anymore there are a lot of decks that can just poke for 30 um so it will always be a little bit unsafe on the bench but as you say i was going to mention the whole drampa would you trade a psychic energy and uh, a prize to set up two drampers and you've definitely got to test to see whether giving up that one prize to have a more consistent sort of mid game uh, Drampa is a very, very good card. We've seen how good it is. So, you know, you've just got to see whether that trade-off's worth it. And some people will think it is, some people won't. Um, but it, it's definitely one of the more niche uses I could see um, for this card uh, sort of straight out of the gate as Shining Legends is released. Next up, we have Latios, which is a three-star card in our opinion. Uh, for its first attack, Breakthrough for a DCE does 30 and 30 to one of the opponents benched. I've just mentioned there are a couple of things doing 30-30. Um, in the format 
we've got Boswell next set, but we do indeed have this Latios as well, which is really, really nice. It's another sort of interesting uh, spread attack that I think is semi-comparable to Tapu Koko. Obviously, Tapu Koko, Tapu Koko's flying flip does 20 to everything. This is 30-30. Uh, now you'll lose a lot of the time you're losing net damage because you're going to be doing more damage with Tapu Koko. But if you think about it, if you're getting two flying flips off, instead get two breakthroughs off. And against anything that is rare candied against you, you're actually you've actually done more relevant damage. Um, so you know it could be there could be decks that decide to run Latios over Koko instead uh, to have more favorable numbers against or, or with things like Miraculous Shine. Also, with a breakthrough plus a choice ban, you're doing 60-30, so you're actually setting up the first one, as, uh, setting up the active as well, if they've rare candied, um, or against anything that has 60 HP that evolves into a stage one anyway. So yeah, there's not too much sort of in-depth about this card, it's just very comparable to Tapu Koko, as sort of early game pressure, uh, setting up these devolution strategies that we're seeing more and more nowadays. Yeah, it's just another one of those sorts of devolve-style Pokemon that adds to the plethora that we already have feels like sniping is like a big factor of the format right now and having this as an extra option is pretty cool and in some decks you will choose this over Tapu Koko in others you won't but um, I think just having this as a option it's one of those cards we've said three star means get it in the binder and even if that, even if that means just one copy I think it'll be one that you'll be happy to pull just because sometimes it'll go in over the Koko just because the numbers are a little bit sweeter in certain matchups so Let's move on to Shining Jirachi. I think this is a card that was definitely hyped a lot when it first came mm. out. Um, probably, in my eyes, one of the more overhyped cards. I think this is still, in my eyes, kind of mediocre. Jack's going to give you the argument of why it could be useful. <laughs> um, in my eyes, the reason why I think it's just overhyped and probably won't actually end up seeing a huge amount of play is because it's a very specific attack. Um, it's a 70 HP Psychic Pokemon. For one Psychic Energy, you deal a base of 10 damage, and if your opponent's active Pokemon is an evolved Pokemon, devolve it, putting all evolution cards on it into your opponent's hand. So, it doesn't matter if they rare candied, or if they went through a natural progression into a stage 2, everything goes back up into the hand, so essentially, you need to deal 60 damage to take a KO on something. Actually, you only need to take 50 damage, because you do 10 of your own. And if you actually choice ban a Jirachi, um, you only need to do 30 damage, no sorry, 20 damage to one of your opponent's Pokemon. And we know that Coco does 20 to everything, so in theory, the idea is you do a Coco flip, and then you Psychic Energy your Jirachi with a choice band, and it's ready to devolve and take single prize KOs turn after turn. Um, and be sort of like a two for one, but really it'll be a one for one prize trade because you're devolving, it's just the fact is it's a big tempo swing. We've seen how annoying Tapu Fini GX's attack has been. Even if you're not taking prizes, you're gusting a big threat out of the way. And in a similar vein, Jirachi does do that in a, in a different way, I guess. You need to already set up damage and such, but in theory, that can be the best way of going about it. In my eyes, I feel a lot of the time this is worse than just going for a two-hit KO, because essentially you could be two-hit KOing with any other non-EX, and... Uh, be getting physically two prizes rather than taking the one prize because you've done the devolve play and you get them back out of a GX into a basic Pokemon. So, um, I don't know. It feels like a card. Obviously, it will be compared to Espeon, but it's actually very different. If you're playing Espeon, you're trying to set up damage all over the board and take KOs. Shining Jirachi is much more of a specific target. You're trying to get rid of one big Gardevoir this turn because you can't deal with it. But now you have Stellar Rain that could deal with it in a turn. So it seems to be like a sort of panic option just in case anything gets out too out of control. Which I guess is pretty cool as a one-of in some of these Psychic decks. We know that Trampa Garb and Espeon Garb are still popular. Even some Rainbow Energy Garb all variants potentially. So yeah, it's an option as a one-of. I'm personally not a huge fan of it, but Jack will probably try and sell it to you guys now. <laughs> I'm not going to say too much more than that. You pretty much covered everything I wanted to say, but I do think I do think inherently Espeon is a better card, like straight off, because it's a colourless energy, so it's definitely a better card. But I think for Garbodor decks specific, almost specifically, um, I actually am going to be trying Stellar, uh, Stellar Ranger Rachi in here, simply because you, it, it's it's a huge tempo swing, but it can it can be good early game or late game in my eyes. 
in like if they've only got one guardy set up, you are putting the pieces back into their hand, yes, but you're taking a routes off the board. And this weekend I played in a tournament where I, I lost games because people were just able to deal with routes after routes after routes. And if your opponent is doing that, it can be really annoying. I don't think the the card is like insanely good or anything. Um, but I think it's definitely going to be one I'm trying out because I think just the inherent sort of uh, strength of fully devolving a Pokemon, um, it's it's quite good in the early game to slow them down. And if you're able to take a prize off of it as well, that's great. But also ending your opponent down to one and then Stellar Raining can actually still be really annoying. Um, and that's that there's going to be specific situations where it is slightly better than Miraculous Shine if they have, uh, if your opponent has um, obviously gone for the curly, for the full build, let's say we're talking about Guardi here, for the full evolution into curlier routes, Miraculous Shine isn't really going to do much to them uh, in, unless it's taking a knockout once they've devolved. Whereas Stellar Rain, if, they've, if you're putting all of those cards back into the hand, it forces them to have candy. So there are very niche situations where I actually see Shiny Jirachi being slightly better than Espeon. And I think exclusively in Garbodor decks, uh, I'm definitely going to test it out just to see whether it is big enough, it is a big enough of a tempo swing, or whether it's just worth having the whole sort of flip the board state and going a little bit more heavy on the flying flip um, and trying to take multiple prizes from a devolution, or whether it's nice to just try and slow the opponent down by devolving instead. I'm not going to sit and say it's an insane card because I don't think it is insane. I think it is easily a two-star card, and me and Joe flip were flipping between one and two stars between us. Um, so it's not it, it shouldn't be any higher than two stars without a doubt. But I do think this will see some. Uh, it, this this does warrant a, a semi. So uh, you do need to, at least to get one because I think the attack warrants um, at least testing around because putting a whole evolution back into their hand is such a it's just such a tempo swing, especially if you're able to pair it with either a knockout through choice band or just like an N or something like that. There's things like if they've gone through all of their rare candies and stuff, it's just, you know, it's just better than just devolving once into a curlier because Miraculous Shine isn't doing anything then. But yeah, it's not, it, the card isn't insane. It's just one I'm going to be playing around with. Overhyped. Right. On you go. Next up, <laughs> next up we have Mars Shadow, which actually is a card that I think was has been underhyped. Um, it feels like a lot of people have kind of glossed over this card. It has the Let Loose ability, which is the exact same ability from a Giratina from Platinum back in the day. Uh, essentially, uh, the ability is Judge. When you play this from your hand onto your bench, each uh, each player shuffles their hand and draws four. Um, so this is actually really, really nice early game sort of disruption, especially if you're able to find it turn one. Unfortunately, there isn't any fantastic way of searching this out other than Ultra Ball. So it does mean committing your Ultra Ball for the turn or a couple of other sort of uh, niche things that we can do to find Marshadows. Um, but it's not anywhere near as searchable as it perhaps has been in the past, things like Level Ball. Um, but that being said, it can be really, really nice. We've seen decks, uh, at least in the UK, we've seen decks that always went for the turn one red card, um, which is essentially what Marshadow is doing. Uh, but the nice thing about this is because it's an ability rather than an attack, not the red card is, but because it is an ability, we can also then pair it with something like Big Wheel GX to try and minimise the outs of our opponent having an N um, to sort of put our put our, our Big Wheel GX back into the deck um, and mean that we don't have our resources and we've wasted our GX attack for the turn. So, you know, it is nice to reduce those outs, um, especially if you can do this turn one. Big Wheel is a GX attack, I feel is either done on turn one or is done the turn before you win. So if you're going for the going down the route of, I don't have any other play turn one, right said isn't doing anything, that's just big wheel to have, to be able to do whatever I want next turn. Uh, this could be a nice little way of um, improving the odds of you getting to keep your big wheel. The other interesting combo is, as you can see, Zerkatry is back. Uh, his GX attack in combination with Delinquent and the Let Loose ability is actually a really, really disgusting combo. So you let loose your opponent down to four cards. You do indeed then need to draw a delinquent off of those four cards, provided you have a stadium in play. But with four delinquent, four ultra ball, and four tapu lele, relatively high odds of doing so. Um, obviously, it's still a lot of resources. Um, but if you're you're then able to delinquent, provided there's a stadium in play, so your opponent has to discard three of their four cards, and then you use Zerkit Tree's GX attack to put their last card as their seventh prize. Uh, and so they've essentially got a zero card hand potentially from turn one, uh, which is really, really disgusting. It's a lot of resources, um, but it can mean that your opponent is playing from a zero card hand from turn one. And if they're not able to top deck out of this, 
you can then start uh, sort of applying more pressure with some of your other attackers. So yeah, it's nothing sort of game breaking uh, or game breakingly consistent that we need to worry about it too much, but it can be game breaking. Um, and if anything, it really shows off the power of Zerkatry GX, which is uh, again a card we're going to talk about more in depth in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, once again, it's like a teaser for the cards that will be coming out of <laughs> Crimson Invasion. I really like Zerkatry, and putting your opponent into a zero card hand from potentially turn one is disgusting. Uh, I think the more likely approach that we'll see Marshadow is with the Dramper, though, because so many decks crumble on the early turns, especially if they're playing just little 60 HP Pokemon to start off with. Um, if you are able to um, put them down to four and then just go for a big wheel yourself, um, not only are they, you know, fairly, well, much less likely to actually do anything, uh, they're much less likely to end you. And when you have that much hand advantage as a Dramp or Garbled or deck, um, you're really going to press it the advantage and start pressuring them very quickly. So um, I like Marshadow for sure, um, specifically in Drampa, and could also start being an annoying red card style Pokemon to really slow down different opponents and reset their hands. So yeah, pretty cool card for sure. Next up we have Spiritomb. Not too much to say. It has a pretty glamorous ability. Cursed Whirlpool, as long as this Pokemon is your active, your opponent's active can't retreat. But we have Guzma, so it's much worse than the previous Snorlax's block ability. That was a card that I actually loved playing back in the day. Um, so shout out to him, but that's about it because Guzma is around and there's even tons of Garbled decks as well to shut off the ability. So, yep, yeah, it's a shame, but the format just isn't right for Spiritomb. Yeah, whilst we have Guzma, this isn't going to see too much play, but it's interesting having this ability back in the format. Next up, I've done it again. I've ended up get, getting another GX, and this is a five-star GX without a doubt. Zoroark GX is a fantastic card. As you can see, we've lumped Empoleon, Raichu, and Zoroark. All saw huge amounts of play uh, when they were in the format. Raichu still is. Um, but when it was back, back in the day, it saw a huge amount of play before uh, EX has got super big. And... You know, it, this is three three very good cards, all lumped into one with more HP than any of them. Um, it's just, there's just so, this card is insanely good. So looking at the card itself, it's got the trade ability. Once during a turn, you may discard a card from your hand. If you do, draw two cards. Really simple, but really, really good for just ditching stuff you don't need anymore and carrying on drawing through your deck without using your supporter. Meaning you can play your Guzmas, you can play your things like Mallow and Kakui. Uh, which, you know, you wouldn't normally be able to play because you'd need a lot of pieces. Um, so you couldn't play these cards actively. Now you're drawing as well, so you can play your niche, more niche supporters, which is really nice. Secondly, it's got, for a DC, it's got Riotous Beating, which is 20 times the number of Pokemon you have in play. That's 120 for a DC with a full bench. That's 150 with a Choice Band, and that is 170 with a Kakui. So that's a pretty good number. That's also 180 with... Uh, the two stadiums that we have now, we have uh, Reverse Valley and Joe, what's the other one called? Um, uh, something, wa Decaying Wasteland, I think. Decaying Wasteland, I can't remember what it was called. Which, again, another card we're seeing in Crimson Invasion uh, that gives all of your dark types an extra 10 damage. So that's 180, so we're hitting 170 and 180. Um, and whilst you'll have to take our word for it here, the Kakui Choice Band combo we've tested with other attackers, and it's actually not that inconsistent, especially when you have access to trade anyway. So... It's not that sort of far-fetched that you're going to have a full bench plus Kaku plus Choice Band because you can build your deck around it, especially when you have trade. Uh, me and Joe have done it before we even had trade, so trust us on this. <laughs> Finally, the GX attack tricks the GX for two Dark Energy. Choose one of your opponent's Pokemon's attacks and use it as this attack. Now, a little public service announcement. We still haven't had a ruling as to whether you can copy another GX attack. Um... So for now, we will assume that you can. That's insane. You can just choose a GX or choose any attack on their board and use it. And that means people are actually going to have to think about what they play down um, in order to play around this trickster GX. Even if, they, even if it can't copy GX attacks, people are still going to have to think about what attacks they have visible on their field that, they, that can be abused. Trickster GX, whilst it is two energy, it can copy such simple attacks that your opponent isn't playing around uh, sort of just attacks that do 10 and a 10 snipe to the bench or whatever. If your opponent isn't playing around that, you know, it can copy a simple attack like that and still sort of perform a huge board swing if it's taking four prizes. 
So, you know, it's gonna it's actually a really, really interesting mind game as well about how your opponent builds their board setup just so they can't be abused by tricks to GX. Um, and that's just the card itself. Looking at the support the card has, in general, if you want to some sort of justification as to how good this card is, in Japan right now, it is, I'm pretty sure it's the best deck in format uh, from what I've heard. It's in insanely good because we have Skyfield and Propagation Execute. You can actually trade for essentially free each turn, plus you can have uh, Riotous Beating doing 180 without any multipliers, without any choice bands or Kakuis yourself. Provided you have a Skyfield full bench on board, which you're always going to have because you're trading into these uh, extra cards, extra extra basics to bench down. You can also run Lycan Rock, so you can then Lycan Rock exactly the target you want. And because it's expanded, uh, you have things like Hex, so you can then finish your turn with a Hex after you've tr after you've done all your trading and your all your Bloodthirsty Eyes and Propagation. You can finish your turn with a Hex um, and just sort of stop your opponent from doing anything whilst you've got huge dominating board set up um, and as soon as it goes back into your turn you're if you've got three Zora GX up you're drawing an extra six cards for completely free so that's that's kind of the justification as to why Zoroark is a good card uh, it's without a doubt going to see some playing expanded uh, but looking at standard we have we've seen Zoroark do well in the past foul uh, not foul play um, mind jack Zoroark has seen play in the is it mind yeah mind jack Zoroark has seen play in the past we've seen it do well Drampa Zoroark has been a has been an archetype that has done incredibly well over the past sort of three to four months. We have the break, so we have the full Zoroark package already. Uh, it's just you're just only adding two or three new cards into that deck already and just building the rest of the deck in a different way to be able to abuse this trade ability. Things like Kukui, as I mentioned, uh, can push Riotous Beating into a one-shot range, which is nice, while still extra draw, so you're you can be uh, essentially sycamoring because you're getting loads of trades as well uh, plus you're doing your extra damage from Kakui that's how good this ability is you can mallow into the exact two cards you need to trade so you can use your supporter to discard a card from your hand to search your deck for two cards if that was a supporter everyone would play that card that is insane so that's that's essentially the kind of thing you're looking at in combination with mallow um, so yeah that's that's why this trade ability is so good whilst it's so simple it's really, really powerful. Uh, comparing it to things like Oranguru and Octillery, I think is the best way of looking at this. When I'm not 100% sure whether it's going to be a deck in Standard right now, um, because it doesn't have the support that it does in Expanded. And Dark, again, isn't a fantastic type, as Guardi is debatably the best deck in format, and has resistance on Darks. Uh, but that being said, uh, we've started to look at lists ourselves over here uh, at Omnipoke, and we're starting to build... A Zoroark style deck that does look like it can compete with Guardi. Um, so in general, that's why we're seeing Zoroark as an attacker. But some people are seeing this as perhaps a potential replacement for Octillery or Oranguru. Uh, I think it's going to be mainly down to personal preference a lot of the time, except when you have some kind of discard synergy. Uh, that's why we've got the Aqua Patch and the Dark Ride GX right there. There's certain decks that do really, really like discarding cards. Any water deck loves discarding water energy to be able to Aqua Patch back on. And then Darkrai loves discarding its Dark Darkrai GXs and its Dark Energy to again be able to restore up, uh, restoration them back onto the board. Uh, and all of these sort of this slots into every single deck anyway because Riotous Beating is two colourless energy as well. So yeah, on the whole, Zoroark is a fantastic sort of mid game, early and mid game attacker. It's got a really really efficient ability, meaning that you can't ever be end, which is really nice. Very uh, similar to Octillery and Oranguru. And just in general, it has um, a fairly well-built engine already with Zoroark uh, from Breakpoint and the Break. You know, we've seen this deck do well in the past. If anything, it's just getting an upgrade and having a GX with a huge amount of HP um, that can just increase the consistency of the deck on the whole. Man, I'm so hyped about Zoroark. Um, I think it's really good, Jack. You've covered a lot of things there. Just want to gloss over a, thing, a couple of things again. Think about this card as Octillery that can attack. And that just straight away is like so insane. It's like when we saw um, Tapu Lele, it's like a Lugia that has an ability that gets a supporter. Or like it's a Jirachi EX with HP and can attack. So that's the same thing basically. So now um, you can just get such good hand advantage with Zoroark. That's what's insane. Like if you think back to playing Empoleon, 
he didn't do a lot of damage and his HP was like high at the time because I remember us playing max potions, but it wasn't like <laughs> insane. The way it worked was because it just had such insane hand advantage, it could do so much in its turn. And that's what you can do if you get multiple Zoroarks in play. Um, we've started theorying lists. I really liked him with uh, Darkrai GX. Um, you've said, Jack, that Kakui is much more reasonable if you have like two or three Zoroark in play. You can trade to draw six cards and Kakui to draw two more cards. So it's like you've done a Sycamore. Um, and that Kakui then pushes Dark Cleave into 180 with a Choice Band as well. And that's just like really, really good. Um, you're also discarding Dark Rise and Dark Energies. These are things you want in the discard pile already. So I think it could be time for Dark to start making a comeback, especially with Nihiligo GX. It then makes Dead End GX a really good GX attack. So that could be really strong. Um, we've already mentioned Mallow, so as soon as you get one Zoroark up, you can start Mallowing and getting multiple set up if you go for a thick line, like a Zoroark focus deck, um, which is insane, and we still know Mind Jack's a really good attack for a DC that can get one hits with a choice band if people want to, you know, Lele for Bridget and stuff, which a lot of decks have to go for, um, but as you've said, it can just be a 2-2 line or like a 1-1 line, just like Octillery has been and we have to see whether or not it will be better or worse. Discarding right now can be a little bit painful. There's Garbro around, so you have to be careful when you discard item cards. You never really want to discard too many supporters because it doesn't really help your consistency um, because you're just getting rid of more supporters at the time. But cycling through the deck in general, I think is better than Octillery because there are many turns where you have a hand where Octillery won't get value, but every single turn, Zorak will get value for you. So. I think it's just an insane card. The more you get into play, the more value you get as well. So I think there'll definitely be decks focused around him, but there will also be times where he's a 1-1 one, one or a 2-2 two, two of because just gaining consistency is insane. And uh, also it's time to revisit Foxy Dramper because you now essentially have one extra slot in the deck to cover uh, the artillery that I used to play in the deck. Um, some people played a Rangaroo, but this is just like a straight include over it if you're already playing Zorak pieces. So... Yeah, just a really insane card. I think everyone agrees that this card's insane. And uh, when we start seeing this uh, play out, I think it'll just justify itself even more. It's just a really, really good card. On to Yveltal now. It is another strafe Pokemon. It does for a double colorless energy 30. And you may switch this to one of your... Uh, sorry, switch it with one of your bench Pokemon. Very simple stuff. Um, we have Choice Band and Reverse Valley and the Decaying Wasteland thing. I really hope that's the right name. Um, <laughs> to increase damage, so potentially you're doing 70 a turn. Um, it's not a huge amount, but it's one of the best Strafe options we actually have in the game right now. Strafe isn't great, but it's better than it used to be now that Versus Seeker's gone. So people are limited to three or four copies of Guzma, depending on how greedy people go. And we actually gain Hooper, which is a really insane card that Jack will be talking about in a moment. Um, so we have better strafe targets than we used to have, so potentially we'll start seeing this come back into the game just by forcing your opponent to take a difficult six prize cards. Could be pretty cool. It also has the Oblivion Wing attack in a different format. Now it is uh, a dark and two colours to deal 90, and you attach a dark from the discard to one of your benched. Um, so it can finish things off when you're doing these annoying strafes, poking around, setting up damage. You can then sometimes go for big Oblivion Wing knockouts as well. So it's a reasonable card. I think Strafe probably is just below the line of playability still because its damage output is still too low. And the fact that it's a dark type means that every Strafe is minus 20 against Guardies. So you're literally doing nothing against them. So um, that'd be the main reason why I think this won't work out. But it's good to see that Strafe is getting some more support here. Yeah, I don't think it's quite there at the moment, but I think I, it's good that um, Pokemon are recognising that Strafe is an archetype that has done well in the past. Um, and yeah, as you've said, uh, one of the best things for Strafe is the Hooper, which we will look at now. Um, with the Scoundrel Guard ability, Hooper is a four-star card, we think. It's a pretty much straight upgrade from Alolan Ninetales. Uh, I remember when we talked about Alolan Ninetales back when Burning Shadows was released, and we both thought this card was pretty good considering there's no Hex in the format anymore, so the only form of Ability Lock is indeed Garbodor, um, which runs its own non-GXs and EXs anyway, so it doesn't really matter that you're not going to have your Ability online there, because they're always going to have an answer anyway. So, 
yeah, it's really, really interesting that this is actually pretty much a straight upgrade. It's got 20 more HP, is a basic, um, and has the exact same attack. The only downside is it is one more retreat cost, uh, but that's pretty irrelevant anyway. Um, just in general, it's going to be a nice uh, potential inclusion to a couple of decks we have right now. Um, I think Galissapod could actually really, really... Um, sort of one struggle to deal with this but two because you're running rainbows potentially um even find even see play in it because it this is an answer to volk it means that they have to baby volk you uh and to be able to one shot you they have to baby walk with a fury belt and three steam ups which as consistent as volk can be that can be still difficult um so you could actually still cause some annoyance for volk which is really really nice um, the other main thing I wanted to talk about is actually we've just talked about how Dark could be getting a bit more of a resurgence. Uh, this is a fantastic card for Dark types. Not only is it a Dark type attacker, but again, just having access to a Safeguard style um, attack is just really, really strong. It's going to mean that, or Safeguard style ability, is just really strong. It's going to mean that you can actually really checkmate your opponents if they don't have an answer to Hooper. Uh, you can just straight up win the game. Super Cybolt is only doing 80 for 3. If your opponent can never knock out a Hooper and you don't bench 6 prizes, it doesn't matter how... This could be doing 10 for 100, you're still going to win. Because it doesn't It doesn't matter what the damage is. If they don't have an answer, uh, that's all that matters. So I think it's definitely inclusion, as we've said. Dark could start to come back. Uh, I think the the whole Dark Rizoroark thing could be really interesting. Um, and a one-off Hooper would not go amiss in there. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting that, like I say, they've already upgraded Ninetales from what seemed to be a pretty good card anyway. Uh, but yeah, I think I think overall I'm not overly happy that we've still got Safeguard in the format, but um, there's no there's nothing there's nothing that I don't think gonna abuse it right now. It's just an inherently good card that will always see some play uh, in general. It's, there's nothing that's breaking this card right now. Uh, but it's a card that definitely has the potential to be broken because Safeguard is inherently a broken ability. Yeah, Safeguard's really good. We've seen it over the years and it's just always been somewhat of a factor. I like that it can be a safe haven of energy for Xerneas Break and Darkrai decks. That's pretty cool. He chills on the bench and he's unlikely to get knocked out uh, even with Guzma plays because he's such an annoying target to deal with just for a non-EX. So um, he's pretty cool. As an attacker himself, I think there's too much Garbodor um to be like a quad hooper list um so don't worry about that but it is something we have to bear in mind more and more there's an alola nine tails and there's a hooper now in decks so people need to be running either garbador or other non ex pokemon to deal with hooper um so that you can actually take it out without it without having to just lose like by running out of goosemas essentially and again, it's an upgrade to Donphan. Hooray! It's a it's a deck that I was trying to improve for Expanded, and this is a really cool card for uh, Donphan. An extra strafe target is nice. So, thumbs up for Hooper, keeping strafe alive. It's one of my favorite like themes of the game. Uh, so, I really hope we can see that archetype get pushed and Expanded. Yeah. Next up, we have Shining Rayquaza. This is another one that has been sort of looked over by many people, but Dino Boys is surviving and it's moving on to the Eel package. And moving away from um, Bronzong, in my opinion, because we can do the beautiful damage of 190 uh, for a fire, two lightning, and a colorless, and you discard three energy from Shining Rayquaza. But we have double dragon energy, and we have Dynamotor, so in theory, chaining 190 on a non EX is just insanely good. That's just like a really, really good attack. Um, you can play Giratina EX as well. Um, to have Chaos Wheel. Chaos Wheel's really annoying for like Night March. I know they play one copy of Ranger, but it would still really be awkward for them with like Karen plus Chaos Wheel. You pretty much win the game. So I think this is a big upgrade for Eels. I really do think that they will be moving over to a double Dragon Energy style package and bringing Shining Rayquaza to the forefront. I think it definitely outclasses um, Raikou as an attacker just because you do so much now. 190 is a fantastic number. You have Muscle Band to get to 210, which then deals with like Galissapods. Um, and in general, you're one hit KOing. Um, Turtonators, Ho O's, Volks, Dark Rise, every basic Pokemon. So just really insane. Uh, we've always loved Eels here at Omnipoke. And uh, <laughs> having a new non EX beat stick is really cool for the deck, I think. 
Yeah, definitely. It's like rails of old, but new because you're doing Sky Judgment for 190 on a 90X now. So yeah, I'm definitely going to play around with this. Next up, we have some of the items. There's only three to talk about today. First off is Damage Mover. As you can see, we've got a potion down there. Tell me the last time you saw a potion in a competitive format. Uh, that kind of tells you how good Damage Mover is. It's move three damage from one Pokemon to another of your Pokemon. So in certain situations, it's actually worse than potion. Um, but certain situations, it will be better, I suppose. Drampa is the big one that people talk about. Moving damage from your active Drampa that's taken a hit onto the bench to be able to Berserk next turn or this turn. Um, but it's, it's such a niche use. Uh, for a, an item that you're very rarely going to see on turn two um, without running multiple copies of it, and it doesn't do anything for the rest of the game, so you don't want to be running multiple copies of it, so that means you're running low amounts of it, so then you're not going to see it, so it's an irrelevant item. So yeah, it's uh, another kind of... It hasn't been overhyped because there hasn't been much hype to it, but I remember when people first saw this card, they were like, oh, Drampa, yes, and actually, it's not actually that helpful for Drampa. Yeah, really bad card. I think one of the worst cards I've seen in a long time. Like, this is actively a really bad card. <laughs> Next up, we have another really bad card. It's Pokemon Breeder. This card allows you to draw two cards. Uh, that's, you know, mediocre. And uh, you are able to heal 20 damage from your active Pokemon if you have no cards in your deck. You can't play this card, which is like a line of text that me and Jax just laughed over because it's so useless that... <laughs> I don't know why they added this line of text, but it just makes the card even less usable for really weird spots. Um, but yeah, how good is Healing 20 uh, in a supporter form? Well, we've seen Pokemon Center Lady, not seeing much play lately. Um, Olympia saw some play, but that was before Guzma came out, and most of the time you were playing Olympia for the switch effect, and the heal was the afterthought. So um, this is kind of like a inverse version of Professor Kakui. And oftentimes in the TCG, dealing damage is far better than healing damage. So Kakuiing to get knockouts wins you the game, whereas sometimes healing means nothing for you. So I think Pokemon Breed is really bad. Um, it really is not a good healing card for a supporter. And it's not a good draw card. So it's just like in that bad middle ground. Like it would have to heal like 40 or 50 to even be considered in my opinion. Because right now it's outclassed in so many different departments by better supporters. Yeah, I mean, the, this card was bad before I read the rest of the text. But the fact that you can't play the card if you have no cards in your deck, there's such niche like situations where that matters. But me and Joe listed off about five, where actively that kind line of text means you'd never even play the card anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just it's just crazy how bad this card is. Um uh, but yeah, it's it's like my favourite card in the set just because it's so irrelevant. Um, so yeah, it's quite a, quite an interesting little card, but it's just really, really bad. Finally, energy-wise, we do have one new special energy. We have Warp Energy, which is a reprint from old, so you can get your Warp Energy out of your bulk box uh, and start playing those again. This card provides one colourless energy. When you attach it from your hand to your active Pokemon, you may switch that Pokemon to your bench. Um, so yeah, that's a really, really nice sort of effect to have. Uh, the biggest problem right now is, one, there's no real decks that abuse having a colourless style attack or a no real specific energy style of attack, so you never really want to be attaching a single colourless energy. You want to be having your energy type for turn a lot of the time. A lot of attackers right now don't have too much colourless in their attacks anyway. There's no deck built around colourless attackers, um, really, because Dra Drampa or whatever it's paired with usually wants to have uh, either Psychics or whatever to be able to uh, still use the rest of the deck. So Warp Energy wouldn't be doing too much. Plus, again, it's only one energy, and when we, when we have double colorless energy, it's almost exclusively better. Um, even though you do get the switch, we have things like Floatstone, Guzma, Acer Roller right now, uh, if you want to be moving out of the active in particular. Uh, so just inherently, it's not a fantastic option in the format room right now. Plus, secondly... Things like Righteous Urge and E-Hammer. E-Hammer is starting to float back into lists uh, as as Guardi rises in popularity. People that people are beginning to say, right, I can't one-shot a Guardi, that's 230 HP, so I'm going to stop it one-shotting me, um, meaning that people are naturally going to be playing Hammers anyway. So because of that, Warp Energy is just going to be moved off the board anyway, or discarded anyway. So whilst it was a fantastic card back in the day, when uh, around the Diamond and Pearl era, I played this 
like in Gyarados. This was this this is how long we haven't had this card. That's like seven or eight years ago now. Uh, it's just not right for the format we're in right now, which is a real shame because it's nice seeing some seeing them sort of take a nod back at uh, these old energy cards that we've seen in the past. Yeah, I mean, you've said that special energy gets super punished right now, and there's no deck that screams, I need a warp energy in the deck, especially because we have so many good other options. Decks are already playing three to four Guzmas, and we're playing heavy floatstone in a lot of decks already, so we're spoiled for choice on switching cards, and the downside of attaching a colourless energy for your turn is quite severe, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, warp energy currently doesn't fit, but it's one of these that sometime soon it could pop up that a deck could benefit from warp energy so worth talking about at the very least so yeah. that will cover our full set of shining legends you can now pause and see what we felt overall were the ratings so even though this set did get berated yes there's only one five star card that will definitely impact the game which is zoroark hooper will also have a big impact and there were a few um three stars that we're being conservative on the raichu could end up being a deck that um is tier one or two um we said that there's enough support there to maybe keep it going and people to test with and there's a bunch of cards that in the right situations could also be good so a few two stars there that if it catches your eye it's worth getting if not you don't have to get it it's not something that you can't play the game without it's not something that has to be in everyone's binder but if it caught your attention via our discussion, it could be a card worth picking up. So some real interesting stuff from Shining Legends. It's actually a set that, even though it wasn't very large, pretty much a lot of different Pokemon had interesting attacks or interesting abilities. So it was a really fun one to explore. And um, I think it'll be a fun one to collect and also try and get a few of these Zoroarks for. They're probably going to be expensive, but here we go. We have to get them. Yeah, definitely. Uh, other than that, as I've mentioned throughout the video, we have Crimson Invasion, the Crimson Invasion set review coming in the next couple of weeks. Still working out some things for that, still theory crafting some things, uh, because that is a full set. Uh, and there's a lot of, again, very interesting archetypes in there. Not the most competitive set we've seen in a while, uh, but there's, again, definitely uh, going to be some cards worth talking about. And yeah, other than that, uh, just thank you very much for watching. Make sure you stay tuned to Omnipoke. Uh, we're streaming again as normal every week. Hopefully we'll um, start getting some more interesting streams again now since we've got Shining Legends. It's been uh, a little bit dull over the past couple of weeks because we've been playing a very similar format. Uh, but as as we've mentioned, this week we can start looking at some of these new cards um, in action, which is going to be really, really nice. So yeah, other than that, thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack with Joe from Omnipoke, and I look forward to seeing you guys in another video.